Today's experimental mathematics seminar speaker at Rutgers University is our very own, my uh, esteemed co-organizer, Robert Dougherty Bliss, who will talk about the meta the finite ansatz. As usual, you're welcome to unmute yourself any second, any minute, at any time, and ask questions, and then mute yourself back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Z. So uh, as Neil mentioned, here in Highland Park, there seems to be some calamity happening outside. I hear lots of sirens and police and whatnot. We're just going to ignore that. If it gets to be too much, uh, we'll pretend it's about the talk. OK, so I wanted to start off with an old identity about the Fibonacci numbers. It's very old, uh, maybe 250, maybe more years old, Cassini's identity. And the exact statement of the identity is here, but what it says in words is something like this. If I take a Fibonacci number and I square it, this square is very nearly equal to the product of the two surrounding Fibonacci numbers, the one above and the one below. And better than being very nearly equal, in fact, it's off by exactly one every time. And better than being off by exactly one every time, sometimes it's one too big, sometimes it's one too small, and it alternates back and forth. One too big, one too small, one too big, one too small. That's the content of Cassini's identity. And if we wanted to check this just for a few terms, we should write down a few Fibonacci numbers. Uh, as a reminder for the, the novices in the room, the Fibonacci numbers are an integer sequence. They start off 0, 1. How I get the next term is I add together the two previous terms. So 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, and 5 plus 3 is 8. So if we pick some, some random terms here, maybe we'll start with 3. 3 squared is 9. And if we look at the surrounding Fibonacci numbers, 2 times 5, we get 10, which is just 1 too big. And if we move along to the next triple, 3, 5, and 8, now 5 squared is 25. And the product of the surrounding ones, 3 times 8, is 24, which is 1 too small. So Cassini's identity says exactly that this pattern will persist forever, one too big, one too small. And of course, Cassini's identity itself, while kind of interesting, is a little boring these days. We've known it for a few hundred years. But once you start to look at all of these different Fibonacci number identities, the partial sums, Cassini, et cetera, different things like that, you get to be kind of bored with identities in and of themselves. And you start to be a little more interested in the underlying principles of the identities. Where do these identities come from? How do we prove these identities? What techniques are useful and amenable to such things? And if you were to give Cassini's identity to say a young undergraduate student, maybe someone in their first year, they probably wouldn't get much further than this slide right here. They'd check a few examples and they'd be on their way. And they'd say, okay, look, we found a pattern, that's great. But of course we know that's not quite good enough. And if we gave it to maybe a slightly more well-educated undergraduate, they might try and do some sort of induction proof. They might say, well, let's take a look at the difference between the square of a Fibonacci number and the product of the surrounding ones. And they might say, well, I don't really know what to do, but I could use the recurrence for the Fibonacci numbers to break one of these terms down. And then I have this. And then they might write uh, something equals something, and maybe they make some mistakes, they cross something out. But eventually, they would get down and they would realize that their expression they started with, this difference, is exactly the negative of the same expression, where instead of n, you have n minus 1. And they would say something about a base case. They would mumble some expressions. And they would say, aha, by induction, we have a proof of Cassini's identity. And of course, they would be exactly correct. This is the classic way to prove such identities. But to be honest, it doesn't really do it for me these days. I don't, I don't know about this induction stuff anymore. I think that the undergraduate who is a little bit less prepared is actually onto something kind of neat and maybe something a little worth talking more about. Because it turns out that you can, in fact, prove Cassini's identity just by checking a finite number of cases. 
And that's because all the sequences involved, these Fibonacci numbers, these alternating minus ones and whatnot, these turn out to be something called C finite sequences. Now, a C finite sequence is not such a complicated definition. It's any sequence which satisfies a linear recurrence with constant coefficients. So you're not allowed to multiply different terms. You can only add them, and you can only use constants in the expression. And the Fibonacci numbers surely qualify because their defining property is a linear recurrence with constant coefficients. There are some other sequences that don't qualify. For example, n factorial does satisfy a linear recurrence relation. It's n times n minus 1 factorial. But the problem is this pesky n here is not a constant. It changes every time. Whereas for the Fibonacci numbers, oh, for the Fibonacci numbers, the coefficients are just constant ones everywhere. So Fibonacci, C finite, n factorial, not, because there's no way to rewrite that expression at all. And then if this definition is new to you, this might also be new. We say the order of a sequence is how many terms we need on the right-hand side, how many terms backwards we need to look to compute the next term. So the Fibonacci numbers are a second order C finite sequence. And you may have even seen this definition in an equivalent way before, depending on what you spend your time thinking about. But one equivalent way to say it is if your sequence is the, happens to be the coefficients of a Taylor series expansion of some analytic function, then that function satisfies linear differential equation with constant coefficients. That's this one here. And if you prefer to think about generating functions, then it turns out equivalently you're C finite if your ordinary generating function is a rational function. And perhaps one of these two will jog your memory. Uh, maybe you've seen them before in a different context. Now we should look at some examples because there are some sort of trivial sequences that are C finite like exponential sequences or constant sequences or polynomials. The Fibonacci numbers are sort of the first interesting one, I guess. But there are lots and lots of nice examples. One here are the Perrin numbers. These are A1608 in the OEIS. They are some other C finite sequence. It's a third order sequence. It starts off 3, 0, 2. To get the next term in the sequence, the rule is I look at the previous three terms, I skip the most recent one, and I add together the two behind that. And what's sort of interesting about the parent numbers is although it doesn't seem to have anything to do with prime numbers, if p is prime, it turns out that p divides the pth parent number, which gives us some kind of test for primality, where if n does not divide p of n, then n has to be composite. That's sort of a weird number theoretic fact that comes out of nowhere. Uh, another classic example would be the Pell numbers. These are A129 in the OAIS. This is a second order recurrence, just like the Fibonacci numbers, starts off one zero. And the rule to generate the next term is it's twice the previous term plus the term before that. The Pell numbers are interesting also for number theoretic reasons. They turn out to give you the denominators for the convergence of the continued fraction for square root of two, more or less. And if you don't know much about that, basically it means that consecutive ratios of Pell numbers converge to root two minus one. And in some technical sense, they converge as best as we could possibly hope for. So these are two C finite sequences that crop up outside of combinatorics for different number theoretic reasons and people think about them. So C finite sequences appear all over the place. And it's good that they do because we know quite a bit about them. But I didn't want to talk so much about number theory here. I wanted to talk more about the world of identities and how we can use properties of C finite sequences to prove things like that, like Cassini's. And for that purpose, the most interesting part of C finite sequences are the closure properties that they satisfy. So if I have two C finite sequences, I can join them together in lots of natural kind of arithmetic -y ways to get sequences that will still be C finite. And I have four of the most common uses here. Example, the sum and difference of two C finite sequences will be C finite. The product of two C finite sequences is C finite, as is the convolution of two C finite sequences. And a little different than the first three, 
if I take a C finite sequence and I look at any subsequence where the terms are in some arithmetic progression, that's also C finite. And even better than all this stuff, let me say, for example, the Fibonacci numbers themselves are C finite. They satisfy a recurrence of order two. This would imply that the square of the Fibonacci numbers also satisfy some recurrence with constant coefficients. But even better than knowing there's a recurrence, we actually have a bound on the order of the recurrences. So the sum of two C finite sequences has order less than or equal to the sum of their orders. Same thing for the difference, the product, the order is less than or equal to the product of their orders. The convolution is back to the sum again. And if I look at subsequences in arithmetic progression, the order actually doesn't change. It might go small, but it doesn't get bigger. So we know that, for example, the square of the Fibonacci numbers satisfy some linear recurrence with constant coefficients. It has order less than or equal to four. But you can imagine how you start combining these closure properties in more and more intricate ways, and you get more and more complicated sequences that are still C finite. For instance, fine, the square of the Fibonacci numbers satisfy some recurrence, but then so does this sequence. The difference between the squares and the, the product of the surrounding Fibonacci numbers. This is also C finite. And when we look at this, this starts to look a lot like what that poor undergraduate student was doing with the induction proof. This is exactly the quantity they were looking at. And with this idea in mind, applying these closure properties, let's take another look at Cassini's identity. So here was Cassini's identity, but now we have everything moved over to the left-hand side. And what the closure properties tell us is that this left-hand side, this expression here, the purple one, it's sort of a random complicated expression, but it turns out that it satisfies some recurrence relation with constant coefficients. And we can break it down a little bit like so. Take a look at f of n minus one. This is a shift of the Fibonacci numbers. So it's C finite of order two. f of n plus one, also a shift of the Fibonacci numbers. So it's C finite of order two. Their product by the closure properties is C finite of order less than or equal to two times two, which is four. And then in the same way, the square of the Fibonacci numbers, C finite of order less than or equal to four and minus one to the N is C finite of order one. So this entire expression here is C finite of order less than or equal to four plus four plus one equals nine. And Robert, let me interrupt. This is very, very uh, 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 crude. Uh, the product of f n minus one, f n plus one, since they satisfy the same thing, is uh, all the three. And f of n squared satisfies the very same occurrence. So it's really all the three. So altogether, nine could be repaid by four. It's true. You could, uh, the bounds that we gave there are sort of crude bounds, as Dr. Z said. We could do I better. Know, if I 10 cases, it's really not as easy to <laughs> five cases. Right. So we could do a little bit better in the order, but for practical purposes for this proof, it doesn't really matter because what this says is that the left-hand side satisfies some recurrence of order less than or equal to nine. Maybe it's smaller. Of course, as Dr. Z said, it's actually less than or equal to four. So it is definitely smaller than nine. But if you want to know if some sequence, this sequence equals zero forever, and you know it satisfies some linear recurrence of order nine, all you have to do is check that it's nine initial conditions are zero. If the nine initial conditions are zero, it's zero forever. So the proof is check n from one up to nine. And it really doesn't matter, uh, well, not one up to n, but up to nine. It really doesn't matter if you're checking from one to four, one to nine, because you just plug this into Maple or Python or Mathematica, or even in your head, honestly, F10 isn't that big. Maybe, oh, no, it's fine, you could do it. So this is a completely rigorous proof of Cassini's identity. And, oh, and it doesn't rely on very much except some kind of abstract nonsense about the sequences involved and being able to check a few terms. Whereas if you go look back at the induction proof, it requires making some fundamental use of the structure of the Fibonacci numbers, like unfolding a recurrence, doing some intricate calculations. But here it turns out because things are C finite, you don't have to do anything like that. It just kind of works out by default. And because you don't really need to make such 
important use of the structure of the recurrence of the sequences involved, it means that lots of other identities involving the Fibonacci numbers are just as straightforward to prove. Here are three other ones. The first one just says the partial sums of the Fibonacci numbers are some random thing, Fibonacci numbers minus one. The second one, that's Binet's famous formula for the closed form of the Fibonacci numbers. And the third one is the partial sums of the squares of the Fibonacci number. And just like Cassini, all of these identities are just as trivial to prove, or maybe not trivial, but just as routine to prove, I'll say, and that you only have to check a finite number of cases. And the number of cases is not more than 10 or something. So on their own, each of these identities is not that interesting. In fact, any identity that you come up with that involves some finite number of combinations of C finite sequences is very easy to prove. It's kind of like saying two times two is four or something like that. It's like, sure, I, I believe you, it's great, it's nice, but it's not that deep at the end of the day. In fact, if you can guess a C finite identity, like if you imagine you were that first undergraduate and you just look at a pattern, if you guess the identity, it's almost definitely true because you wouldn't have guessed it if you didn't have enough data to prove it in the first place. So what gets to be a little more interesting is not specific identities, but looking for patterns between identities and seeing how you can generalize things to stuff that isn't quite as routine to do. Oh, I see the storm has arrived. So there might be a little bit of drizzle in the background. Okay, so I wanna try and show you a little bit of the idea behind generalizing patterns to more interesting cases. But to do that, I wanna say a few things other about C-finite sequences first. Uh, the nice thing about C-finite sequences is these closure properties that I mentioned are very effective. They're not weak existence statements. It's actually, very easy to turn them into algorithmic processes to write down the recurrences. So we didn't need to write down any recurrences when we proved Cassini. We just said, check it, there exists a recurrence, but it's not much harder to actually write down what those recurrences are. All it amounts to normally is solving some small system of linear equations. So I thought I'd show you how you do that at the minimum for F of two N, the sequence of every other Fibonacci number. The idea here is I create two dummy variables, x and y, where x will be f of 2n and y will be f of 2n plus 1. And once I have these dummy variables, I set up this system of equations. So I write down the first three terms of f of 2n. So f of 2n itself is x, just by definition of our dummy variable. f of 2 times n plus 1, if you remember, this is f of 2n plus 2. So if you use the Fibonacci recurrence, you expand it out and you get that it's x plus y. Then the next term you have to expand out twice. Fine, fair enough. f of 2n plus 2, this is the same thing as f 2n plus 4. So you expand it once, then you expand it again, and you get that it equals 2x plus 3y. So if you want to find a recurrence that f of 2n satisfies, what you really want to do is kill all the x's and y's that you see over here on the right hand side. And it's not so hard to see that in this case, how you do it. You take, whoops, you take uh, the last equation. There are three y's. So I kill those three y's by subtracting two times, or three times the second equation. And then if I do that, there's one minus x floating around. So I kill that by subtracting or adding one copy of the first equation. And that will give us zero. So this tells us that there's a recurrence f of 2n, if I rewrite things around, it is three times the previous term minus the term before that, two terms back. So you can see how this might work if you instead had a two, if you had a three, maybe you have to expand something three times, or if you had a four, you have to expand it four times. It gets to be a little tedious to do by hand, but you write a program to do this once and then you never think about it again. And I've gone to the, the, through the process of writing that program. Lots of people have written this program. And here I wrote down the recurrences for the Fibonacci numbers where the sequences we're thinking about are F of M times N. So M varies now from one up to five is what we have here. So this first one, this is just the recurrence the Fibonacci numbers satisfy, just the definition. 
The second one is the one we just computed in the slide before. And then the one after that, the three after that, are just sort of random things that fell out of my computer. Now, each of these identities on their own, kind of boring, not that interesting anymore, just because you just check it for like three or four terms and then you're done. That's a completely valid proof of each of them. So the game becomes not proving each of these identity. The game becomes, what do you notice between the identities that seems interesting? For example, look at the coefficients on the rightmost term in every identity. It goes one, minus one, one, minus one, one. And that's an awful lot like minus one to the M plus one. If you look at the coefficients on the first term, you've got one, three, four, seven, 11. One, three, four, seven, and 11. Okay, these are not as pretty, maybe if you don't spend a lot of time thinking about the Fibonacci numbers, but maybe at least note that these terms here satisfy the same thing the Fibonacci numbers do. Four is three plus one, seven is four plus three, and 11 is seven plus four. Actually, if you spend some time or you look these up in the OEIS, maybe you'll see that these are the Lucas numbers, maybe Lucan numbers if he was from France or something like that. These are the Lucas numbers. The Lucas numbers are an associated sequence to the Fibonacci numbers. They satisfy the same recurrence. L of M is defined to be the sum of the previous two numbers, except it just starts slightly differently. It starts off one, three, rather than one, one. So by creating this list of examples, there's like a weird recurrence between the recurrences. There's like a meta recurrence going on where not only are each of the recurrences true for the different sequences, but there's a pattern between the coefficients. And we even have sort of an explicit conjecture about what the recurrence looks like in general. The recurrence looks like this is the guess. F of MN satisfies some recurrence where the coefficient on the first term will be the mth Lucas number and the coefficient after that will be minus one to the M plus one. So this is a little different than the identity that we had before. The ones involving say Cassini's or partial sums or Binet's formula. Those were single variable C finite identities. And those you could just check a couple of times and then you're done. This is also an identity between C finite sequences, but now it's got two variables in it. And that complicates things a little bit. You can still do something kind of like what we did. You can still do this finite checking procedure. It's just not exactly the same anymore. What I mean by that is writing down this list of identities, this is not enough to prove it as far as we know so far. This gives you some data to produce a conjecture, but your conjecture is not as good as a proof yet. You still need to reach into your bag of tricks and do something else to prove it. And it's not hard to prove. There are still lots of ways you can do it. But for now, the conjecture says, now go prove it until we get to this slide. When we get to this slide, we know that actually- yeah, Robert, do you know the combinatorial proof of the previous? Of this, um, this is a very, this is also a pretty old identity. I don't know a combinatorial proof off the top of my head, but- Because Art Benjamin makes a living proving combinatorially that thing. So I wonder if you can do it his way. Anyway, mm. beautiful. It's a, it's a good question. I'm sure someone somewhere has a combinatorial proof of this because this is a pretty well-known identity, but I admit I don't know one off the top of my head. But when we get to this slide, this slide tells us that actually our conjecture making procedure is just as good as our proving procedure, just how it was for single variable stuff. Because here's an observation. If I have a C finite sequence, A of N, then it turns out A of M times N as a, function of n satisfies a recurrence where the coefficients are constant with respect to n, but they're allowed to depend on m. But those coefficient sequences themselves are also c finite with respect to m. 
And not only are they C finite, they also have a bound on their order, some binomial coefficient bound. But the point is, if I take a look at some sequence like the Fibonacci numbers, and I write f of m times n, this will definitely satisfy a uniform recurrence in m, and that it's C finite with respect to n. And the coefficients that you see will be C finite with respect to m, always. So there's some recurrence, there's like a meta recurrence between the recurrences here. In this case, we actually know that if you trace through the binomial coefficients, the order of the first coefficient will be less than or equal to two, and the order of the second coefficient will be less than or equal to one. Now, why is this a helpful abstract nonsense fact to have? It's helpful because if we go back and look at our list of examples now, we know that in fact, just writing down these examples is the same thing as proving the conjecture. So we don't need to reach into our bag of tricks because once we write down these recurrences here, we know the coefficient sequence for the first one, this one, three, four, seven, eleven. this will be a C finite sequence of order less than or equal to two. And if such a sequence equals the Lucas numbers for three, four, five terms, it's just the Lucas numbers forever. And same thing with the second coefficient sequence, this plus minus plus minus plus minus. We know that it's going to be C finite of order less than or equal to one. So if it equals minus one to the M plus one for enough terms, it's just always minus one to the M. So we actually don't need to reach into our bag of tricks and do something else. This is just a completely rigorous proof of this fact. Once you say something about you know, there exists a recurrence, the coefficients, blah, 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 blah. You say the correct incantations that people want to hear to know that it's rigorous, then it's completely good. So, so what this gives us is a tool now to try and tackle other sort of uniform identities where there are two variables, where maybe before we had to go do something a little more complicated. Now we can just get on our way with making conjectures and seeing what nice things fall out. But it's always nice, I think, to know at least a little bit of the structure of the abstract nonsense that we're talking about when we use these kinds of things. So I thought I would tell you the big idea. And so if you wanted to prove this theorem, I have to admit, it's really not that complicated of a proof. You just need to remember that exponents multiply, uh, which I think is not too big of an ask. Maybe you need to know a few other things, but this is like 90% of the proof, I promise. The other things that you really should know is a little bit about the structure of C finite sequences. A secret about them is that every C finite sequence can be written in a nice closed form. You know, we've seen Binet's formula for the Fibonacci numbers before, but it turns out that every C finite sequence can be written kind of explicitly as a sum of exponential terms. So constants raised to the n, where maybe you need to multiply the exponentials by some polynomials. And it's not maybe in like an, oh, I don't know what to do. It's a very explicit thing. You can exactly write down the closed form of a C finite sequence, assuming that you can figure out what these constants are. So the constants actually turn out to be the roots of something called the characteristic polynomial of your sequence. And it's probably a good idea to say what that is, just in case anyone's not familiar. Uh, when I have a sequence and I look at the recurrence that it satisfies, it's often useful to translate this into the polynomial world because we know a lot about polynomials. And how we do that is we let polynomials act on sequences by being shifts. It looks like this. If I multiply a sequence by a power of x, it's the same thing as shifting the sequence forward by whatever the power is. And then when I say the characteristic polynomial, all I mean is take the recurrence your sequence satisfies and write it as a polynomial instead of a recurrence. And this turns out to be helpful for a lot of things. In particular, it tells you how to go from recurrence to closed form. And going one way, you can basically go both ways. This is almost a one-to-one -one map from characteristic polynomials to closed forms. Uh, for example, if we take the Fibonacci numbers, they satisfy the famous recurrence here. If I move everything over to the left, then I write it down as a polynomial. This is the characteristic polynomial for the Fibonacci numbers. This is a very famous polynomial, of course, because it factors as x minus the golden ratio times x minus the conjugate of the golden ratio. And from knowing that fact, 
the structure of C finite sequences tells us the, the Fibonacci numbers have to be some constant times the golden ratio raised to the n plus some other constant times the conjugate of the golden ratio raised to the n. And you don't know what the constants are just yet, but you can go figure it out. But the, the main idea here is that knowing characteristic polynomials is the same thing as knowing recurrences. And knowing closed forms is the same thing as knowing characteristic polynomials. So if you know the closed form of something, you automatically know recurrences that it satisfies. And that is where we get into the multiplication rule for exponents. OK. So imagine you have some C finite sequence, and you write it down in some closed form like this. Now, maybe to actually write it down in that closed form, you need to be able to find the roots of some complicated polynomial, and maybe you can't do that. But whatever, we're all, you know, we all work in C where you can find the roots of everything if you want, and we don't worry about practical issues for this proof. In this case, we want to know about recurrences for sequences that look like this as functions of n. Well, the first step is to just take this closed form and just replace n with m times n everywhere you see it. Nothing that complicated. Then the next step is to realize that as a polynomial with respect to n, I really don't care about this m very much. This is basically some other polynomial in n. Every term will have a power of m in it somewhere, but I don't care because I only care about polynomials in n. So this is just some other polynomial in n. That's great. And then for this exponential term, I make the great observation that I can pull exponents apart from each other, as long as they're integers and being multiplied. So once I join together those two brilliant insights, I see that actually this sequence is written in the requisite closed form for discovering characteristic polynomials. It's a sum of exponential terms times polynomials. And those exponentials are the roots we started with before raised to the n. That's the only thing that changes. So I take my RK and they go to RK to the M. And what this tells us is that once we know this closed form, it tells us what the characteristic polynomial of our sequence is. Well, maybe it tells us what a, it's a multiple of the characteristic polynomial. It might not be the characteristic polynomial, but the characteristic polynomial then is in factored form X minus R1, the first root raised to the M. X minus R2 to the M. X minus RD raised to the M. Where D is how many roots we have. And what's neat about this is that we actually know, of course, quite a bit about what the coefficients of a polynomial are in terms of its roots. The coefficients of a polynomial are always themselves polynomials of the roots. In fact, they're the elementary symmetric polynomials. But I've written down a few examples here. We can break them down. So if I expand this polynomial, I get essentially the recurrence that A of MN satisfies. And when I look at the coefficients, they are, the first one is one. These are always monic. The second highest one is plus or minus one times the sum of the roots. The third highest one is plus or minus one times the sum of distinct products of the roots and so on and so forth, whatever definition you'd like for elementary symmetric polynomials. Robert, you're assuming the R's are distinct? I am not assuming the R's are distinct. It's fine if they're not distinct. Okay. So what is nice about this is that each of these terms, say R1 to the M, this is some exponential term, but it is C finite with respect to M. And that means that the sum of any two of them is also C finite with respect to M. And the sum of all of them is C finite with respect to M. And if I look here at the next one, this is some constant raised to the M. This is also C finite. All of these coefficients are just sums of exponentials, things raised to the m. So they are automatically C finite by the closure properties. And of course, we can kind of write them down here. As long as you know what the roots are, then you can write down exactly what they are. But the point is, by some abstract nonsense, they happen to be C finite with respect to m. And maybe, Neil, to say a little bit more about your question is, where you get the order bound here is you put a bound on how many terms appear in these sums. Like there are D terms here, 
there are D choose two terms here, but if the roots are not distinct or if they collapse on each other when you raise them to the nth power, they might, these terms might collapse and actually have fewer terms than you think you do. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, yes. But uh, the proof otherwise, just for the existence of some recurrence does not require saying anything more about that. All right. Okay, so that's basically the entire proof. There's really no details left out there. It's just some something, you mutter something about elementary symmetric polynomials, you say closure properties, you use your exponent rule, and you automatically know that these things are C finite. And that gives us this nice uniform approach to write down proofs for F of MN and other things as well. In fact, we've only been talking about the Fibonacci numbers so far. And basically any identity you can write down about the Fibonacci numbers, someone already knows it. Uh, that doesn't stop people from submitting articles to the Fibonacci quarterly with new identities, but uh, we probably know everything that's being written at some point. So I thought maybe we should look at some recurrences for something that's not the Fibonacci numbers. So here's the parent sequence again. And I won't go through the details, but here is the kind of uniform two variable recurrence they satisfy. So P of M times N as a sequence in N satisfies this second order recurrence, sorry, third order recurrence, where the coefficients are a little more complicated than before. The first one is itself a parent number, this is P of M. The second one is some random C finite sequence that happens to be in the OEIS. It's A78712. And it doesn't seem to have any particular interpretation to it other than it's the coefficients of some generating function. Uh, maybe I misread the comments, but it didn't seem that interesting. The last coefficient is actually identically one, it turns out, a nice accident there. But this proving this is, of course, it's routine for any specific M. You just write down a couple terms and you check that it's true. But now proving it for all M at once all you have to do is write down a couple example m's. You say, okay, here's the recurrence for m equals one, m equals two, m equals three, m equals four, and we're done. That's it. You might need to do a little bit of investigation to actually figure out the names for the sequences involved. Uh, it's completely automatic to find recurrence descriptions for the coefficients. You can write a program that will tell you what recurrence these things satisfy but your program won't tell you these are the parent numbers. Okay, fine. If you want to get a nice name for your sequence, maybe you have to go to the OEIS. Maybe you have to sit down and think about it for a minute. But as far as C finite descriptions go, it's completely automatic to do this. Okay, so when we have these recurrences, people, the next question that people always ask is, what do we do with these recurrences? What are they good for? And that's a fair question. It's sort of outside of the scope to tell you everything you can do with recurrences, but it's nice to see some examples of what you can do with them. Recurrences are obviously useful for computing terms of a sequence sort of quickly. If you maybe can't find the roots of the characteristic polynomial, having a recurrence tells you you can compute terms to your heart's content as fast as you want. But there are other things that recurrences can do. You can use them to derive summation identities. You can use them to compute generating functions. You can use them to find asymptotics and the like. And because we have these uniform recurrences in two variables, we get to say all of these things about a broader class of sequence than we could before. I mean, they're all still C finite sequences, but now we have more specific examples than before. I think it would be nice to see some summation identities, for example, that come from this, because the summation identity trick is actually a little less known. Maybe I won't go through the details here, but. So here was an earlier identity about the Fibonacci numbers. It's the partial sums of the Fibonacci numbers are themselves Fibonacci numbers minus one. And this is a pretty easy identity to prove even by induction, it's fine, it all works out. But it has an older brother identity that looks something like this where if you sum not the Fibonacci numbers, but now the Fibonacci numbers whose indices are divisible by M, you get something a lot more complicated than what you started with. 
it involves the Lucas numbers, it involves something alternating and other Fibonacci numbers. But the point is that there's an identity here. And proving this identity is, of course, pretty routine once you have it, or if you want to use the uniform stuff. But you can get this directly from the recurrence using some polynomial tricks. I, I won't go through the details because it's, it's a little boring if you're not interested. But it turns out that if you have a recurrence, you can easily write down any summation identity like this, as long as you're working in the C finite world. And this is completely automatic. This isn't even like go to the OEIS and look things up. This just falls out automatically. And then again, because the Fibonacci numbers themselves are a little boring, let's take a look at the parent numbers. So here are the partial sums for the parent numbers where you look at the indices that are divisible by M. This is an even nastier looking summation identity, which in theory is also automatic to prove, but in practice, I would say it's probably a little challenging to actually discover and prove this identity if you don't know what you're looking for in advance. And one of the big upshots of the observation we made earlier about the coefficient sequences being C finite is it tells you roughly the structure of what you're looking for in advance. Okay, and in my abstract, I did promise to talk about products, although I have to admit, they get to be very messy to put down on slides, but I at least wanted to give you the idea behind where these arguments go beyond what we've said so far. The arguments that we've given are not very specific to the sequences that we've seen. So we started off looking at things like this, Fibonacci number of M times N, but really all that we needed was the exponent rule. And as long as you remember that rule and some other exponent rules, you can generalize the arguments to lots of other situations. Uh, the situation I wanna talk about here specifically is if you look at sequences that are like this. Imagine I took the Fibonacci numbers and I looked at the indices that are divisible by I, and then I multiply them by the ones where the indices are divisible by J. And I think of this as a sequence with respect to N. So again, by the closure properties, I know for any specific I and J, this will be C finite and there's some recurrence. But the question is, is there a uniform recurrence for any I and J that it satisfies? Can we write this recurrence down? How do we prove this recurrence? And it turns out that using basically the same kind of ideas that yes, there is a uniform recurrence that these things satisfy. It's slightly more complicated, but we can still say things about it. So if I have any C finite sequence A of N, if I define the product, this I J product to be P I J of N, then P I J of N itself satisfies some recurrence of some order, saying what the order is is a little complicated, but we can write it down. And the coefficients of this recurrence, these C K of I J's, these are themselves C finite in both I and J. They're symmetric in I and J, and we have a bound on their order. So not only is there a uniform recurrence, we can even guess what that recurrence would be just by computing enough examples and looking at them again. And the fact that they're symmetric in I and J is actually not that deep, I suppose. I mean, the sequence itself is symmetric in I and J, so that's to be expected. Now, I, I don't want to say too much about products because they get to be very messy. It gets to be, you know, taking pages and pages of calculations to say anything nice about them. But I wanted to show one example. So let's say that Pij of n is this product of different Fibonacci numbers, Fin times Fjn. Then it satisfies some recurrence. The recurrence is of order four, and it looks like this. So there's a recurrence here and the coefficients are messy. They involve alternating things, Lucas numbers. But the point is they are C finite with I and J. They're symmetric and we can pretty easily write them down. In fact, we could even give them explicitly in terms of roots of characteristic polynomials. But I went through the hassle of writing them in terms of Lucas numbers instead, because that's a little more visible, a little more digestible perhaps. And I'll also say that if you have this recurrence, just like before, there are also summation identities, there are generating function identities, there are asymptotic results, 
there's all kinds of things that are pretty firmly within your grasp if you're willing to sit down and stare at these recurrences for long enough or to write a program to do it for you. Robert, as far as you know, this is a new identity or it already existed? I don't know. Um, I would say that it's probably implicitly known somewhere because, well, let's see. No, in this particular form. In this particular form, I don't know. I have seen so people... identity due to you. All right, nice. I mean, no, there's a lot of issues of the Fibonacci quarterly. I'd be willing to believe <laughs> someone's written it down somewhere. Okay. Um, but maybe if you do this with the parent numbers, maybe no one's done that before, for example. And so if you sit down and stare at these things long enough, you can come up with generating functions, summation identities, lots of different things that people will care about and would put in quite a bit of sweat proving in particular cases. But now you just, it's just all automated. Just write a program to check and you just find the patterns there and they work. But to, to wrap up here, let's say what we got. So we took a look at these C finite sequences and we were able to find recurrences that were guaranteed by the closure properties, but we didn't yet have a way to say that looking at examples was as good as finding a proof. But the theorem we wrote down tells us that actually, it's just like the single variable case. If you look at enough examples and there's a pattern, you've just proven the pattern at the same time. And once you get those recurrences, you can go find sums, you can go find generating functions, you can find recurrences for products. And if you go sit down at a piece of paper and you scribble some basic algebra rules, you'll see that the arguments apply to lots of other situations as well. But working with just these beginning cases and with products seems like more than enough for us right now. So this seems like a good time to stop, I would say. Yes, thank you, Robert. Um, we have uh, 40 seconds for informal questions, but after this, you're welcome to uh, stay for informal questions. Quick question for Robert. Yes, I, I have one. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Robert. Can, can you go to slide 22? I can try. Let's see. Slide 22. Yes. Yeah. So this C2, is this the same C2 that you showed before? Yes, it is. Same C2. Okay. It might be an interesting sequence, actually. That should be. It was, let's see, A78712. Yeah, yeah, but it, it shows here and, and then later, so pop-ups in both places. Yeah, it's true. And this comes from, by the way, the recurrence trick. So you can always find these kinds of summation identities if you know a recurrence for a C-finite sequence. So it isn't surprising that it crops up in both places. But again, maybe if there's some combinatorial reason for it, I would be interested to know it. Thanks. Well, let's thank Robert for a great talk. And Robert, please stop recording. My people are welcome to stay for a few more minutes for informal questions. Thank you. Yeah, I'll stop recording myself. Uh -huh.